Welcome back to another episode of the Goonery. Uh, we're back this week, fresh off of my win in the Song of the Summers draft. I um, actually had two songs in the championship. Very surprised by that, to be completely honest with you. But uh, hard fought battle. Uh, just me and Brandon this week, we're going to be talking some NFL and just the real issues we've been seeing in Major League Baseball that have been all over the news seem the past few weeks. But Brandon, we're going to just get right into it. Um, with the announcement today that the Bears, uh, that they said they put in an official bid to move out of the city and buy the land of Arlington Racetrack, about an hour north of the city in Arlington Heights. I don't see a problem with that. Obviously, I know you're a Bears fan outside of, uh, outside of the state. People have been all up in arms about it all day online. I don't get it. Soldier Field's a dump. It's second largest market for football in the country, and it is treated as it's treated like the complete opposite. It's the second smallest stadium in the NFL and the potential to have a bigger stadium. You could have Super Bowls. You could have final fours. You could host WrestleManias. You could do, there's endless possibilities there. And it'll, at the end of the day, it allows the franchise to make a lot more money because they're not paying the, uh, not paying the Chicago park district. It's a very, very weird thing because I don't think people really understand how big Chicago is in America. Chicago is extremely, extremely popular. So if you have the the potential to get a new stadium, you, you go straight ahead with it. Now, you see the trend of stadiums that's been going on, not even just football with baseball, and even to a certain extent, extent basketball. There are some certain things that that – are being incorporated in terms of just like concession stands or just just um, state of the art um, things that they have going on, like in terms of the aesthetic. Mm -hmm. Why would you not want that if you're if you're the Bears? But you have to think that hey, you know, we're talking about a team that doesn't really make big splashes. We're talking about a team that's been boring just in terms of just 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 capturing headlines. Because if you only think about it, the Bears, only capture headlines because they don't have a quarterback. Other than that, you're not really talking about them. So I think if you if you are the McCaskies, you make that move only because you want to make more money. And just like you said, imagine wrestle, imagine not even well, maybe not WrestleMania because we don't know how weather we don't know how the weather's going to be in Chicago around that time. But just the 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 prospect of knowing that you can have a lot of events and that's going to bring in revenue for your for your team and your stadium, why scoff at that idea? I'll never understand it. And I think it's an interesting spot, too, because the idea has obviously been tossed around the past year or so that the McCaskies are potentially going to sell within the next few years. And the fact that they're putting in a bid in for Arlington, that allows new ownership. Obviously, new ownership is going to most likely try and build a new stadium regardless, but they have a complete blank slate to begin with. They have Soldier Field through 2033, and at that point, I, I mean, I think by 20, by 2033, they're out of there regardless. So it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. But you had mentioned that Bears struggle to catch headlines if it's not um, in regards to the quarterback position lately, their lack of a quarterback. I know you, how you feel about this. Uh, Matt Nagy coming out and saying this week that Andy Dalton is undoubtedly the starter and Justin Fields basically has no chance of starting this year. Now, here's the thing. We know – who Andy Dalton is. He is a guy that's going to throw touchdowns, but he's also a guy that's going to throw interceptions. And that interception part is the most notable because it just came out in minicamp. He threw four interceptions mm -hmm. in minicamp. Now, if you can't get over your struggles in minicamp, what makes you think when training camp comes along and preseason comes along and then you have to face probably the number one defense in the NFL week one, for you to come out and make that statement, I think it's really stupid. Only for the fact that you drafted the guy number 11 and Andy Dalton hasn't been a legitimate starting quarterback in a couple of years. And what that tells me is that you think that his Justin Fields development process is going to be a little bit longer. And truthfully, I don't see it that way, because if you're going off the, the fact that he was drafted number 11, I think that was just a lot of GMs just really not paying attention to how good of a talent mm -hmm. he really was. And contrary to, you know, him being actually really good and leading Ohio State to a national championship and, and a bowl game, of course, because, you know, they're a powerhouse. Mm -hmm. But he's been he's been the anchor of that powerhouse. There's a difference between the two. So I don't I don't get I don't get it. But we know Nagy to be kind of a stubborn guy. And and I don't know. Because I don't want to rag on him too much because, I mean, we did that enough throughout the last season. But at the end of the day, I do think that, you know, 
there's there could be a situation where somebody may not be telling the truth and if that's the case so be it but just for the fact that he had to state that i don't think that's a good optic i i do agree with you in the fact that it should be a quarterback competition. Whoever ends up having the best camp, the best preseason should start week one. You drafted Justin Fields to be your man, your guy of the future. Why not? If he's ready, let him do it. Take the, take the reins. Although I do think it's kind of interesting, though, because you kind of had a sense that the locker room was divided last year, obviously, over the quarterback situation between Foles and Trubisky with uh, Nagy saying that it's going to be an open competition all offseason. So maybe this is him just trying to get the locker room to kind of – I don't want to defend Matt Nagy because I'm not a Matt Nagy guy, but maybe it's just this is a spin zone, him trying to keep the locker room as tight knit as possible, rally behind Dalton and have Dalton. Dalton knows his role. He knows he's going in there. What is it? It's a one year deal. He knows after that he's he's gonna be gone. And I for everything I've seen, Dalton has taken fields under his wing. Do you want Andy Dalton teaching Justin Fields the ropes? No, but it's it's the point. I don't know what to expect. I still think Justin Fields should be our quarterback, obviously. Um, but it's, I have no idea what to expect for our Bears this year. And it's make or break for Nagy at this point, I think. It is because if you think about it, just the talent can be maximized with the right quarterback. And you see that just – from certain guys, like we see with Tom Brady, see with Aaron Rodgers, and, and in no way am I comparing Justin Fields to those guys. But my point is that you, there are certain guys that can get certain things out of certain people. And I do think that Fields has that has that edge to him that he can galvanize the, the weapons that's around him. And then when you look on the defensive side, I think it's a really good thing that we are hearing good things about Kendall Vildor in the secondary, considering that you don't know if Trufant's going to stay healthy for a full 17 games. And Jalen Johnson, he said he's 100 percent, but, you know, he's he's stepping into being a number one corner when he was just the number two in a rookie last season. And you have an aging Danny Trevathan, Roquan Smith's going to be looking for a new contract. Robert Quinn has to, hey, hey, he has to do better. There's no way he can be even worse than last season. But I do think that's just, I, I think that there is going to be a different feel to the Bears defense only because there's a familiarity with the defensive coordinator. And there was not, a, it, it seemed like everybody on the defense was speaking glowingly about Sean Desai. And that's a good thing because r- being in the right position is something that it felt like everybody was I feel like everybody was out of position under uh, Chuck Pagano. But mm-hmm. now they're restoring the feeling, and that's the most important thing. Yeah, so a lot of optimism, I would say, for the Bears these next few years. But um, if you head a little bit north, not as much optimism up in Green Bay with uh, Aaron Rodgers still yet to report to camp, um, to minicamp. Obviously, it's minicamp, but it does not appear that – Rodgers is going to be going, showing up in Green Bay anytime soon. And in my opinion, the Packers are foolish for not even taking calls on him at this point. He has not made it clear that he wants to be a Packer or he doesn't want to be a Packer. But the reality is he has not given any indication that he wants to show up to camp. Mm -hmm. What was it, mini, mini camp or training camp? So that right there, that that's a big thing. And he went on talking to Kenny Maine about where his standing is in the, with the Packers. That should tell you, like, listen, like, we need to start taking calls because right now you're seeing what you got out of your quarterbacks that's on the roster right now. And in a in a in a perfect world, you will want to, you know, catapult that momentum into training camp what you have with Jordan Love in case he is going to be the start of it. What well, it's going to be. Blake Bortles or Kurt Banker, whoever the hell they they want to go in that direction. But for right now, your hands are tied. And if you want to have him on the books for this season, when it's possible, it's very, very possible that he could sit out the season, what are you doing? Mark Murphy can't keep his mouth shut. Now, granted, I want him to keep talking because right now he's digging himself a bigger hole, but he keeps talking saying he's a complicated fella. You think Aaron Rodgers, like, let's be real. Aaron Rodgers is a very, very sensitive dude. Like, mm-hmm. and a lot of people are not going to talk about it. He's very, very sensitive. So do you think that he's going to be cool with Mark Murphy saying that? Hell no, he's not. Not at all. So 
right now the Packers are in a situation where they have no choice, but this is all they're doing. And if they don't make a move, then they're just going to have some someone on their books who, who is getting paid a lot of money and for what? Trade him now and just get it out the way because I guarantee you this is going to be a distraction all season long, even if he's not playing. And you don't need that for a guy that you drafted in the first round to be your future starting quarterback. 100%. It has Le'Veon Bell, Melvin Gordon type of holdout written all over it. And I mean, we've seen it's derailed both of their careers, to be completely honest, them holding out. I mean, Rogers, obviously much different talent than those two. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves here, but fresh off an MVP. I mean, I can think of a lot of teams who'd be calling for him right now. I mean, it was, it, it was on draft night. The Broncos supposedly had a deal in place for him. And honestly, that's probably why they passed on fields. If I, if I, if I had to guess and Hey, I, I'm, I'm thankful if that's the case. Yeah, but if I'm a Packers fan, I'm I think I'm officially nervous. I'll say that. And as a Bears fan, it makes me it it, it makes me overjoyed. And if you would have talked to me about maybe a month ago, I would say uh, he's he's just bluffing. This this is just way of his of him trying to get what he wants. But then again, right now, what can Aaron Rodgers possibly do to get what he wants? There's nothing that can be done. Gutekunst is not getting fired. Mark Murphy isn't going anywhere. And I know those are the main two guys he has an issue with. So for right now, like, if you want to deal with a rift between those guys, with, well, with all three parties, they go right ahead. But guess what? There's not, there's no winner in this unless you make a deal. Yeah, and that's all there is to it. So kind of pivoting towards baseball. We've seen it the past few weeks a lot of issues um people calling out pitchers for sub using illegal substances on the mound um obviously the mlb just made a drastic drastic call by implementing 10 ga- 10 game suspensions in the middle of a season and yeah you're that obviously is going to ruffle some feathers and i think tyler glass now um the first reaction that i really saw regarding the issue uh after he most likely it's going to need tommy john again He's a big, big guy, so that also might have something to do with him uh, hurting his UCL again. But he came out and said, in regards to the rule change, do it in the offseason, give us a chance to adjust to it. But I just do 80 innings. Then you tell me I can't use anything in the middle of the year. I have to change everything I've been doing the entire season. I'm telling you, I truly believe why that, why, that's why I got hurt. So obviously that's Tyler Glass now admitting to the fact that he was using an illegal substance. But... I mean, they are now ruling rosin and sunscreen as an illegal substance, which guys have been using for as long as time. So I, it's going to, regardless of how many injuries we've seen this year already, I think those injuries are going to start uh, piling up even more. I mean, Glassnow said the big reason he thinks he got injured was the fact that he relied on his fingertips a lot for uh, throwing his pitches. And he was instead just gripping the ball a lot harder in his palm. And he thinks that's why he got hurt. So I don't know if I believe that reasoning, but I fully understand his, his logic about implementing that uh, suspension during the middle of the year. If there's one thing that Rob Manfred is horrible at doing is reading the room, because at the end of the day, this boils down to two things. Now, like you said, baseball is a game that seems like it's so tainted is always something that's just wrong with it that a fan could look from the outside and be like all right they're using illegal substances what are they going to do about it because let's be real over the past how many years there's been pitchers that have been using illegal substances you just can't be so blatant with it that's the thing because you're not you can't be like Pineda who that one year he was just smearing all over his head and got thrown out the game it happens all of the time so it's a drastic call, but it boils down to two things. Now, there was a point in the time, there was a point in time in the season that the league wide average for hitting was in the 230s. Let's keep something in mind. When baseball was at its peak, it's when home runs were just skyrocketing. You had guys on steroids just, just blasting the ball 420 plus feet. That's the time where baseball was cool. And obviously that had to, that it took a bump in the road when the Mitchell report came out and that baseball was even under more fire. And now while that situation has been 
thrown to the wayside, you have juiced baseballs to get more pop out of out of guys. And obviously it worked, but apparently they stopped using it. And then what's in the middle of it? The Astro scandal. So what did, what does all this mean? This is a way for MLB to cover their ass and be like, you know what? My bad for the, the piece of metal comment. My bad for not punishing the Astros, quote unquote, and we can move past this. Because right now you have you have AJ Hinch, who's at the helm of the Astros cheating. Carlos Beltran is going to get a job again, by the way. He's going to get a job again. And Alex Cora is coaching the Red Sox. So what was the real punishment for that? Nothing. No one, not a player, and a coach suffered except for Beltran. But he's like I said, he's going to be back. So right now, it just looks fugazi on MLB's part to do this right now. Because if you really think about it, this is just them saying, my bad. We're going to do better. We're going to be more proactive. And even if it's at the, the cost of pitchers, it's okay. Because now we're going to clean up our game. But at what cost? And you you brought up the Astros and how they got virtually a slap on the wrist for cheating their way to a World Series. Ryan Spader, baseball writer, came out um, the other day and unleashed quite the threat, if I have to say, about cheating allegations that have been in baseball the last decade, we'll say last decade or so, give or take. And obviously, baseball's cheating is honestly synonymous with baseball. Let's not kid ourselves. People are doing whatever they can since the game has started to get a competitive edge, whether it's stealing signs. I mean, that's part of the game. It's part of the game. But once you bring technology into it, that's where, I mean, the line kind of is drawn, in my opinion. If you're stealing signs while you're a player on the field, fine. That's part of the game if you're being that blatantly obvious with what you're doing. But, I mean, Spader said uh, the Royals were the first team to implement video and analytics right near their dugout when they won their World Series in 2015. Uh, Yankees had cameras on left, center, and right field to alert their hitters. And then he mentioned Aaron Judge's uh, – home and road splits. I still think Aaron Judge is a very good hitter, and I really don't know how much I read into that one. I think Judge is, Judge is incredible. There's there's no doubt in that. Yep. But then uh, the Dodgers uh, having an employee being caught setting up cameras in Minute Maid Park. That, that's alarming. Um, calling Chase Utley the biggest cheater of all time. I didn't give any, didn't give any reasons, but I He's probably one of the yeah, dirtiest. Word for it that yeah, way. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, at that point, it's, yeah, I don't doubt it. And the one that kind of like blew my mind that was never caught was Adrian Beltre having a buddy who would sit in center field with binoculars, and if there was, if there was a breaking ball coming, he'd wave a white beater, a white, a white white beater. And I mean, his 2017 home and away splits. I mean, he's still great on away, but at home he hit 362 got on at a 440 clip on the road. He hit 271, got on at about a 330 clip. That's a big, big disparity. And I was looking that I looked that up actually today. If you had to guess, what would you guess Adrian Beltre's career war is? Uh, no, I, I can't guess that. <laughs> I can't guess that. It is. I'll tell you this right now. It's higher than Ken Griffey Jr. It's what? higher than Griffey. He has a career war of 93.5. Wow. 10 points higher than Griffey. You know what? It's not as crazy as it sounds. It's I not mean, as crazy as it sounds. None. He played forever. And he played for over 20 years in the league, and he played at a high level. But it just, like, it makes you think, like, who else was cheating like that then? If Was he doing that his whole career? Because he's a surefire Hall of Famer, undoubtedly. <laughs> And he's, he's coming up on being nominated because when he retired, I think he retired three, four years ago. So he's right around probably in the next cycle. So it's just, it's very, very interesting to me to, me to see if MLB does anything with these allegations for Spader. Because obviously it's a baseball writer. It's obviously, you're, you're taking it with a grain of salt, but I do believe it. Ryan Spader is a good writer. I don't know if you read, read any of his stuff. He, he knows what he's talking about. So I, I, I don't know. I really don't know what to think of this because i mean his allegations went as far back to the twins playing at the metrodome right so I, I really don't know but something just kind of bringing it back towards um back towards present times in terms of the balls being doctored trevor bauer mlb's resident either love yeah, him I or hate. yeah i would say love him or hate him i i am definitely on the hate him side 
but he posted a video on Twitter, not sure if you saw it, of him having a ball just hanging from his hand like it was like just hanging like that. And he said that was just all rosin. Then again, I, I don't know if I can believe that, but he came out and basically said uh, they've knowingly swept this under the rug for four years. Now they have implemented a knee-jerk reaction to shifting public perception. Hard to hear them talk about competitive integrity when they have no integrity to begin with. Which, I mean, it, it, it's a fair point. Trevor Bauer, for years now, has been in the media trying to alert people of other pitchers using shit, illegal substances, and isn't it, wouldn't it be something if the guy who began this all by calling everyone out years ago ended up using illegal substances last year in a miraculous Mickey Mouse Cy Young year to get that big contract and then um, is now leading the charge to ban substances after getting his bag? It would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? It's Remember, people, this is a life lesson. It's always the loudest person in the room that's always the biggest full of shit. And this guy who is coming off a Cy Young year on a shortened season, of course he's going to talk his shit. Who wouldn't? So if this comes out that he's using it, and, and I think it's, it's clear he's using it. This, this, this goes back a couple podcasts. We was mm-hmm. talking about the potential that he's using it. And the fact that he's taking this stance, I don't want to hear a damn thing from him. I really don't. Like, it, like this, this, this is just who he is. This is a guy that just wants to control the narrative where, however he can. And even if he comes off as the most blithering hypocrite, he's going to divert from it. That's just what he does. That's just what people in the media that's just, that is just makes their living or being a troll, that's what they do. So if that's the case, I wouldn't be surprised. No, I, I wouldn't at all. And it's not that he's having a bad year either. I mean, he's not. He has a sub three ERA. He looks like he, I don't know if he's living up to having the highest average valued salary of any player ever, right? Or pitcher ever right now. But he's still, he's not a bad player. I'll say that. But I just, I don't, it, it would be very, very interesting to see if he comes down and it gets taken down in all of this. But yeah. something else that, has been very interesting during this whole debacle the past week or so was Pete Alonso coming out and saying that he thinks that basically across the league players know that the league manipulates the balls year in and year out, um, depending on what the uh, incoming free agency class is looking like, which is, it's kind of interesting. If you look at it, like based on the years where you have the balls are juiced, the balls are dead this year, for example, balls are supposedly dead. Batting averages are at, an all-time low across the league, sitting in about league average, high 220s, low 230s. Granted, that might be because pitchers across the league are using legal substances, getting insane spin rates or spin rates under pitchers. So you, you don't know, but isn't it something that the headlining free agents this year are Corey Seager, Chris Bryant, Carlos Correa, Trevor Story, Javi Baez, Rizzo, Michael Conforto, Marcus Simeon, guys who are all having very good years and some of the best shortstops in the league right there that I just named probably of the one, two, three, four, the four shortstops I named probably easily all top six, seven, eight shortstops in major league baseball. So it wouldn't surprise me. Cause then if you look, I'm going to say the pandemic season kind of a wash in terms of that. But if you go back the year before you have Garrett Cole, Zach Wheeler, Lance McCullough, like they, the, when the balls were clearly juiced that year so it's it's an interesting theory from pete alonzo and it scares me for the end of the end of this year with the collective bargaining agreement being up i th- I, I don't i thought i didn't see the correlation with his with his point because i because there's just so many trends in baseball where it's just like like you you can see this about every single season but think you but Every single season, there's just a certain thing that comes out. So I never really see the correlation between the two. And, like, I don't know. Like, I even because I heard this comment about a couple of weeks back. And, and I was, I'm, even now, I'm still confused by it. I, I just, like, I'm still trying to struggle with the correlation between the two. Yeah, I definitely, I definitely not taking it, like, as gospel. But I think it's been interesting to look at just, in terms of stats, stats the last few years, seeing um, 
the booms and pitching or the booms and hitting year in and year out. Obviously, the talent on the mound in Major League Baseball right now, league wide, is about as good as it's ever been. So that uh, very well could have something to do with it. You know, guys throwing harder than ever. Their pit, their breaking pitches are better than ever. Insane spin rates. So obviously, with as analytically driven as the game is now, that could very much have something to do with it. There's no doubt in my mind. But I do think it's an interesting point. Pete Alonso is kind of known though to be a guy to try and be a quote machine, I guess you could say. I mean, playing in New York, be, being in New York, you're gonna have those guys, which is fine. It's fine. Just I, I get it. But um, I just, it's very interesting too, because I also just found out that Major League Baseball a few years ago bought out Rowling, Rawlings, who makes the baseballs for major, the Major League. Hmm, I didn't know, I did not know that. Yeah. So, but it, it, it does, it, it does make sense though. It makes a lot of sense considering the balls being juiced, balls being non juiced. Like, of course, they would be in control of it because why, why would Rawlings have anything to do with that? Why would they mm-hmm. want to be responsible for all that stuff? Mm hmm. So it's very interesting too. So I just, if I'm major league baseball, I'm letting pitchers get whatever advantage they want. I'm letting hitters get whatever advantage they want. Just get more eyeballs on the game. The talent that's out there right now is as good as it's ever been. And people just, I mean, I'm bringing it back to the Twitter trolls. Like we talked about in the last episode with kids just commenting ratio LW on every tweet or post a real sport whenever like any yeah. major media outlet posts anything about baseball that's mm-hmm. the younger generation's general perception of major league baseball it's a boring game and it's like people say that the game needs to be sped up so what does major league baseball do they in theory are um deadening the balls so the pitchers have a greater advantage that's just my theory there so they're trying to pick up the pace of play with that People are saying the games are too long, but then people are complaining there's not enough hitting in baseball because the balls are dead. So it's just constantly running in a circle for them. With It's like a dog chasing its tail. You're never going to get there. You're never going to get there, never going to get the solution you want. And when it comes down to it, players are going to have to cheat on both ends to make the product more entertaining. Like, And it sucks, but it's the truth. And no one, no one league wants to be as that as known as the league that cheats. And I get that. Mm-hmm. But right now, as things stand right now, you are really behind the eight ball. And this is in terms of NFL, NBA, NT, NCAA baseball, NCAA basketball, football, you name it. You're behind all that stuff right now. And a lot to do with it is not just from the standpoint that you can't promote your players. But also, you change the you you change things all the time. The, you know how hard it is to keep up with so many things that's changing in the game. NFL can afford to do that. NFL can afford to have position plays with single digit numbers because they they bring in the numbers. They can afford to extend the game uh, this, this season to another game. They can do that because they have been putting up numbers for years and years and years. As baseball has been changing. Like, not for nothing. Like, I feel like the last really good period in baseball was the Astros and Dodgers World Series. Mm-hmm. Out, and then after that, it just been scandal, scandal changes, and just the most, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Just impulsive things that's been going on. Mm-hmm. Like, what is going on? It, it just the, the struggle to find continuity and... It, it's it's hurting it's hurting them so so much and it's sad to see i love baseball but damn it this game doesn't feel the same anymore it really doesn't it's just too many things that's going on it's not the baseball i grew up with i'm not a gatekeeper of baseball but still i can acknowledge when things just don't feel right no i mean i really don't know if i could have said that any better myself it does not feel the same and it honestly, like I had mentioned earlier, it scares me with the collective bargaining agreement being up at the end of this year. And as is looping back to me being a White Sox fan, obviously, but in the 90s, the last collective bargaining strike screwed over a White Sox team that was first in Major League Baseball and screwed them out of having an attempt to go after a World Series. So that's just in their prime. It just, that scares me as a Sox fan, considering this is our window. I mean, look at them. They're missing three of their best players right now. Um, presume majority of the year I, I would say they've been without stars for longer periods of time in Anderson, Abreu, Michael Kopech 
Lance Lynn missed a start, and they're still in first. And the fact that that could potentially be taken away from them to have a year with everyone in theory where they should be fully healthy, I mean, that scares me as a fan. And it sucks because you could just see the very – there's very clear um, – a very clear disconnect between the players association and the owners. And I don't see that being remedied anytime soon. I mean, just the, the fact that this decision was made, this was a decision made by the league office and the umpires, the players association was not contacted. They, they didn't talk to them. So with that being said, I hope people are prepared to not have baseball in 2022 or, or be delayed. Like, things are really, 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 really strained between the two. And, like, just, you know, as a Cardinals fan, just knowing that that might be the case, I'm not bothered by it because, it's like, <laughs> what do I care at this point? But, like, just from the, the – the, as a standpoint – from the, the standpoint of a fan, you're just like, man, like, that decision alone is really, really, really going to make things interesting and mm-hmm. not in a good way either. And what pisses me off, too, about the whole collective bargaining agreement um, debate is when people say, oh, you're getting paid to play baseball or if you're at whatever sport. And it, it, it's like it's still their job. Do you want to be disrespected by your boss or your uh, your fellow employees or whoever you're working with? No, you get you get irritated. You complain to people about who you work with all the time. And no one thinks it's weird just because they're on TV making millions because they're talented at a game. Who, like, I, I don't understand that logic, and I never will. It's the haters' they, logic. That's what it is. It's the haters' logic. They wish they was in a position of those that they're criticizing, so they're going to make themselves feel better about themselves because when, when they feel like they're whining or being crybabies, I, people like that, they, they, they irritate the hell out of me. They, like, just say, I want what you have, and just move on. Just, just move on. That's exactly what you're, that's essentially what you're saying. Like, mm-hmm. I get it. But mm-hmm. don't don't be stupid about it either. Oh yeah, and like don't get me wrong, do I like I understand like oh, I like want to see them play. I want them to just get over themselves. But that's me being selfish. Like at the end yeah. of the day, it's being selfish as a fan and like I can fully admit to that, but I'm not going to I'll be very upset if a uh, if a lockout occurs, but I'll understand and hope that at the end of the day that lockout pushes the game further in the direction that it very very clearly needs to go. And you know something, it, just last year, just being without sports for the months, you would think that that was a time of reflecting, a time to just be without sports for a time uh, for mm-hmm. the time being and just dealing with yourself, dealing with whatever's going on in your own place or whatever. But as you can see, that people being away from sports has made people even more insane with their takes. And... You know, I've been, I've got, I've graduated from the the selfish point of like, damn, like why they don't, why don't they want to play? It sucks that they're not playing because even when, in the pandemic last season, when uh, the the games got boycotted because of the um one of the shootings that happened, um I found myself saying, good for them, because at the end of the day, you got you have a decision that comes down like that in baseball with the players not even being like in in the middle of the conversations in a decision making and just like yo people need to understand these organizations don't care about the players as much as you think they really really don't care so it's extremely important that you be on the athlete side because once you're on the athlete side that's when the organizations are going to fold because the players are the ones who make the money at the end of the day. If you're on their side, that's where things, that's where the whole dynamic changes for everybody. And that's, I mean, that's the truth. I mean, talking about a uh, disconnect between ownership and players, like let's look at minor league baseball right now. I'm not sure if you saw um, that story about the, I think it's the Orioles, uh, either double A AA or triple A team. They have a 13 game homestead uh, homestand coming up. They were given a stipend for two weeks of like 600 something dollars. And that's supposed to pay for their living and for their food. And that's, I mean, minor leaguers make no money and it makes no sense to me with how much these teams make the fact that these guys are bringing in about 12, 13, 14, 15 grand a year when obviously they're not 
playing in the bigs, but they're still a professional athlete at the end of the day. And Mm -hmm. these guys are, they start sleeping in their cars for this. They said, because they can't afford to pick between food or hotel, which is ridiculous. And you would think that they would care, but they don't, they don't. And it's unbelievable. But yeah, keep, keep the, keep defending organizations, keep the, keep crapping on players for basically leaving the sport early or saying that I don't want to play or just anything. There's still people that saying you're still playing baseball. You're still better than a lot of play, a lot of players in the world or people in the world. So what do you have to complain about? And those are the people that obviously have not, have not committed themselves to something as important that makes them a lot of money because then they'll understand. Cause this is this this whole this whole thing of sports organizations. This is a this doesn't stop at sports. This is organizations all around the world, and people gotta learn the hard way. And until they do, they'll never understand. And you know what? If they don't, if they don't understand short order, trust me, it'll, it'll hit them in the face. And who can feel bad for them? I sure won't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I could not have said it any better myself. There, so I don't have anything else to add. Brandon, you have anything else you want to add before we wrap things up here? Um. I, I, I'm aware of our audience on the Goonery, but damn, y'all couldn't give any love to my songs? I mean, damn. I got ousted in the first round. I had one song go to the second round. I'm like, damn. But you know what? It's fine. I actually want to keep doing these. And yeah. by the way, thank you to everyone who voted because this was an experiment. And truthfully, this experiment might expand into something bigger and more list, more drafts, whatever it is, I am down for it. So thank you to, to those who voted. Yeah. So if you guys have any other suggestions of a draft you guys would like to see, hit us up on Twitter, YouTube, on the blog, and anywhere. We would love to hear what you guys have to have to say because I enjoy doing the drafts. And I think it was a good way of having some conversation, generate some interaction between us and the listeners. So with that, don't forget, like, share, subscribe on YouTube, leave us a review on Apple or in Spotify, wherever else we're found, and we will see you guys next week. Thank you.